I'd like to define mindfulness as a threefold attentional skill set uh, consisting of concentration power, sensory clarity, and equanimity. So to the extent that I am a, quote, meditation teacher, um, I teach concentration power because that's universal to any form of meditation. Uh, to the extent that I am a mindfulness teacher, I also emphasize the sensory clarity and the equanimity. Then there is the extent to which I sort of have my own distinctive way of going about mindfulness. Um, and uh, that is um, definitely has certain um, distinctive characteristics. Um, a lot of it goes to my background. I have um, a pretty solid amateur knowledge of science and, and mathematics. And that has informed the way that I teach mindfulness uh, in a very, very deep way. How so? Uh, well, one of the things that you learn uh, if you uh, get into uh, the physical sciences or mathematics at any kind of depth is you learn habits of precision in um, expression and thinking. Habits of, of precision. precision. That's correct. Okay. In other words, uh, in ordinary colloquial English, um, force, impulse, uh, uh, energy, potential, momentum, um, <clears throat> uh, action, and so forth, eh, they all sort of sound like the same thing and we might use them interchangeably on occasion. But in physics, each one of those words that I mentioned means something completely different and distinct. Each one is defined very, very carefully and um, in many cases, it took centuries for, those, uh, for that precision of language to be honed and perfected. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, in the uh, area of mathematics, if you take a beginning calculus class, you learn of the definition of something called the, uh, the derivative of a function. And, uh, I remember that. You took that? I did. I don't remember. I remember those words. I yes, don't remember, you, remember what they you may are. remember some. You may remember. I remember a volume of a function, but I can't remember. What well, you mean. may remember uh, an expression along the lines of uh, for, uh, for any epsilon, however small, small, there is a delta such that if delta is the absolute value of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Sure well, anyway, that's the definition. Uh, that's part of the definition of. Um, the limit of a ratio uh, that's used to uh, define a derivative. In any event, it's defined with this, it's like incredibly subtle and incredibly complicated, and you have to read it over and over and over and over again until it finally sort of registers, and then after you've read it about 100 times, it's like, oh, duh, of course, that's, that's so natural, it's so obvious. Now, what they don't tell you in your beginning calculus book, and what would have helped me a lot if they had told me, was that that definition of the derivative was not the one that Newton, who invented calculus, used. Uh -huh. That was the result of generation upon generation. Um, a good um, 17, 18, 19, yeah, like a good 250 years after Newton of the finest mathematical minds, um, Euler, Gauss, Cauchy, Weierstrass. I know most people have never heard of these people, but they're, they're among the mathematical geniuses of the Western world. Each one of them contributed something to that definition that the others hadn't seen. That's, that is the... Uh, the distillation of 300 years of contention, discussion, and thinking things over, the end result of which is this incredibly precise, incredibly powerful concept. Well, you get used to dealing with that level of precision, and you get used to the notion that you're going to have to 
really think about the definitions and read and reread and reread because of, it's worth it. Because um, an ordinary high school student who is willing to come back over and over and over again will be able to understand this as well as those, better than those mathematical geniuses because their stored wisdom mm -hmm. is there. I like to think of myself as on a mission to take the mist out of mysticism. Uh, I think it can be done. Mist out of mysticism. Yep, it can, using mysticism not in the sense of new age airy fairy, but in the sense of classical mystical experience as exists inside the, uh, the great traditions of the world, uh, essentially contemplative experience. Uh, I'm a, a academically, I said that I have an, uh, a good amateur's knowledge of science and math, um, but I have a professional academic trained knowledge of comparative mysticism and Asian languages and uh, Buddhist studies and so forth. That was my degree in graduate school, my degree program. So um, I sort of bring a, a very strong scholarship background because of knowing um, most of the uh, Asian languages in which the uh, technologies of internal exploration of the East are encoded. Then I have this scientific thing which uh, causes me to be extremely precise about how I define terms. People that work with me have to be willing to put up with that, but it saves them a lot of time in the end. How so? Well, they're able to um, eventually communicate and conceptualize the entire path to classical enlightenment precisely in words. That's taking the mist out of mysticism. So you ask me what's distinctive, I, I bring a scholastic background, mm -hmm. I bring a science background. And um, that informs the whole way that I teach. And then um, I, uh, because I have this sort of broad view of world meditative practice, I've created a system that is a, it's, how can I say, um, uh, it is a, um, a framework within which all of the major innovations in con historical innovations in the, uh, the contemplative technologies from the past, all of those major innovations can be um, formulated within the framework that I've created. I call it five ways to know yourself as a spiritual being. Each one of those five ways represents <clears throat> a distinct innovation that happened in history, mm -hmm. but I've reformulated it into modern secular language and placed it all on a, a, a universal framework within the um, <clears throat> uh, mindfulness tradition. 